Before I begin, I want to note that this video is not about price or investment. It's about the history of Bitcoin as a technology and its usage on the web. So with that cleared up, let's begin. It's 2008, and oh boy, it's time for a financial crisis. It all started when house prices saw a massive boom in the mid-2000s, and we all know what that means, banks salivating at the mouth to sell you a mortgage. Financial institutions that were lending out mortgages started giving them to pretty much anyone, indiscriminately, with far fewer restrictions. And as these housing prices kept increasing, banks kept buying more and more securities backed by housing prices, which meant that when all this came crashing down and the housing bubble burst, they were completely screw. Having made a complete fool of themselves, the banks did the only dignitious and logical thing and asked the government to bail them out. So the US government got out their magical wallet of infinite money and bailed out a bunch of large financial institutions so they can keep making the same mistakes over and over again without any kind of repercussions. This decision was not well received by a lot of people. But while most complained about the government overstepping its boundaries and violating the concept of laissez-faire capitalism, the one conveniently forgotten point is how this crisis completely undermined the current banking system. Just look at this yourself. People all over the world were getting in lines to withdraw money from the banks they didn't trust anymore. But hey, what can you do? People store most of their money in banks. It's not like it's possible to create some kind of digital decentralized medium of exchange where through some clever cryptography every individual user is at complete control of their funds with no central authority to command it all. Oh. In a move that was most likely inspired by the complete incompetence displayed by banks in 2008, an unknown software developer, known under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto, created Bitcoin. Through some clever use of pre-existing technologies like symmetric encryption and proof-of-work, alongside a completely new concept known as the blockchain, Satoshi was able to create the first ever completely decentralized medium of exchange. It all began in August 2008, when the Bitcoin.org domain name was registered. On Halloween, Halloween 2008 was the first appearance of the Bitcoin white paper, which was a document that explained how Bitcoin actually worked. I guess this is a good time to say that if you want to know how Bitcoin works under the hood, there's a great video by 3Blue1Brown that I'm linking in the description that explains it perfectly. But anyways, dear viewer, all you need to know is that Bitcoin works by having each user hold a private and public key. The public key takes the form of your Bitcoin address, which people use to send you money, and your private key is what you can use to sign transactions so you can spend your money and send it to other people. But explanations aside, the big date came on January 3rd, 2009, when the first ever Bitcoin block was formed. The only transaction was 50 new Bitcoin being introduced into the network, and this note on the part of Satoshi. The Times, January 3rd, 2009. Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. As you can probably guess, that was the headline to the Times newspaper on that day. But also, this was a pretty obvious jab at the banks that Bitcoin was trying to compete with. 170 blocks later, the first ever Bitcoin transaction occurred between Satoshi Nakamoto and Hal Finney, which was one of the earliest adopters of Bitcoin. The creator of Bitcoin himself stated that it was created in a little over a year, which makes it even more shocking due to how solid and secure the code is. Even even after the late Dan Kaminsky, who was an incredibly successful penetration tester, tried to go after Bitcoin, no flaw was found. The code and the protocol were just too solid. This led many to speculate that Satoshi Nakamoto was actually a team of people and not an individual. But personally, I just think he really hated banks and that justified his paranoia. Speaking of Satoshi, he would go on to transfer the ownership of the Bitcoin repository to a man named Gavin Anderson, who two years later in 2012 would go on to form the Bitcoin Foundation, which still develops Bitcoin to this day. But anyways, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to 2010. Throughout the year of 2010, various financial placades have been placed on the political leak site WikiLeaks. Visa, Mastercard, and PayPal had all blocked the website from receiving any form of financial donation. This was an obvious example of unjust political censorship by these large payment processes. So to get around this problem, WikiLeaks opened their own Bitcoin donation address. This was one of the earliest moves to adopt Bitcoin as a usable currency. I guess it's also important to note that later that year, the Silk Road was founded, which was a darknet marketplace that accepted Bitcoin in exchange for illegal goods. 2011 and 2012 were the years when Bitcoin really started gaining their reputation for a coin used by criminals on the darknet. In fact, clearing Bitcoin's name from this reputation was part of the reason the Bitcoin Foundation was created. So 
soon, more and more Bitcoin exchanges started popping up where people could buy Bitcoins using real life money. And soon, more and more businesses were accepting Bitcoin. In 2011, dedicated Bitcoin mining hardware started popping up so people could buy specialized computers that only mined Bitcoin to make them profit. In 2013, the whole Silk Road thing came crashing down and the FBI seized millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. Bitcoin ATMs started becoming a thing. In early 2014, Newegg started accepting Bitcoin and so did the Dell Computer Company. However, they withdrew this later in 2017. Speaking of 2017, it was probably the biggest year for Bitcoin so far, with more and more people adopting its usage and countries like Japan and Russia legitimizing it as a real currency. At the same time, however, Bitcoin was not the only digital cryptocurrency in circulation. Other decentralized digital mediums of exchange started popping up, known as altcoins. The first was a coin named Namecoin, which essentially aimed to be a solution to the problem of buying and owning DNS names. It didn't have as much success as the next fork, which was Litecoin. Litecoin was pretty much identical to Bitcoin except it used a different mining algorithm and, most importantly, the block time for Litecoin was far lower, which meant that transactions were confirmed faster. More and more altcoins started popping up as time went on. The aforementioned Litecoin, Ravencoin, Monero, and Bitcoin Cash in 2017. However, while awareness and adoption of Bitcoin was increasing more and more up until 2017, all of this popularity and demand for Bitcoins brought with it unforeseen complications. Bitcoin was suffering from its success. Yes. The biggest and most obvious flaw that started popping up as Bitcoin became more and more used by regular people was privacy. All the transactions on the Bitcoin network are transparent. Anyone can see your money and where you've spent it. Now, this wasn't really a problem in 2011 when nobody could look at a digital Bitcoin address and link that to a physical person. But as more and more countries introduced laws that forced people buying Bitcoin to reveal their identity, blockchain analysis companies started forming. Companies that their entire job was just to look at the blockchain, trace transactions and figure out who was sending money to who. In a sense, it's poetic. Bitcoin was about as anonymous as its creator. Sure, nobody knows Satoshi Nakamoto's real identity or his home address or his phone number or anything like that. However, you can see his history of posts. You can see what he's done on the internet. He's not anonymous, he goes under a pseudonym. And the same thing goes on the Bitcoin network. When you send money on Bitcoin, it's all pseudonymous. If somebody is able to figure out who you are on the Bitcoin network, then they can easily figure out all the money you've spent, where it came from, and where it's going. Luckily, there was a solution proposed to this in the Crypto Note paper published in 2013, which was later adapted into Monero. But there were other flaws with Bitcoin as well, like for example, its slow processing and high fees. As more and more people started using the Bitcoin network, it became very congested which meant that the transactions would take a longer time to confirm unless you wanted to pay some exorbitant fees to miners. This, coupled with the increase in value of Bitcoin, meant that the average Bitcoin transaction fee in April 2021 was $62. At the time of this video's recording, the average Bitcoin transaction fee is a little under $3, which is still way too much. In 2018, South Korea banned the anonymous trade of Bitcoin, requiring all Bitcoin traders to reveal their identity. Once again, this highlighted the lack of anonymity in the Bitcoin network. This, I believe, is the beginning of the fall for Bitcoin. Like I mentioned before, in 2017, Bitcoin Cash, a fork of Bitcoin, was formed to get rid of the transaction fee issue by allowing more transactions to be included into blocks. To this day, the Bitcoin Cash network is considered by some to be the legitimate Bitcoin network, and the original Bitcoin network currently operating, they consider fraud. Also, remember those dedicated Bitcoin mining hardware? Well, some people in China figured out that you can fill an entire warehouse of those and essentially dominate the network. And so they started doing that. At the moment, the single largest Bitcoin mining pool, Ant Pool, holds over 18% of the hash rate, which is utterly ridiculous. Because it was mostly being done in China, Bitcoin mining became very environmentally unfriendly because, as we all know, the very advanced Chinese electric power grid still uses coal power for a lot of their power plants. Also, those dedicated mining ASICs become obsolete, so when there's an upgrade and more efficient ones are found, all the old ones are thrown away, which causes a lot of e-waste. But I think the real nail in the coffin, the real finishing point for Bitcoin, is this announcement by PayPal. PayPal! Remember those amazing folks? Those nice guys that blocked WikiLeaks from receiving any donations for political pressure? Well, in October 2020, they announced that you'd be able to buy Bitcoin on PayPal. 
but not actual Bitcoin. No, no, you cannot withdraw this into the Bitcoin network. It's just fake Bitcoin that they will pay back to you in the value of Bitcoin. You're essentially buying some fantasy fake stock that represents Bitcoin and not actually buying a different type of currency. This is the ultimate spit in the face to the very concept of Bitcoin, to be a decentralized and uncontrollable currency. The problem with Bitcoin is people treat it like an investment, like a security or like a stock. You're meant to buy Bitcoin to sell Bitcoin, not because you actually want to buy things with it, but because you want to use it as an investment so you can sell it later and use all your earnings in regular US dollars. In the end, I think the best analogy for Bitcoin is gold. Just like gold, it used to be used by pretty much everyone as a medium of exchange, but nowadays it's mostly used to accumulate value over time. Due to a combination of being difficult to carry around, which is analogous to Bitcoin's high transaction fees, and the fact that gold has such a high value makes it very difficult to use as a proper currency. So that was the rise and fall of Bitcoin. It started as the ultimate antithesis to large centralized payment processors and banks, only to become a security traded by banks. Bitcoin may have some serious flaws, but in the end, it's a completely revolutionary piece of technology, something so ahead of its time that we still can't comprehend its importance, even 10 years later. Maybe something else will come and pave the way for the future of decentralized digital exchange. But in the meantime, I've been Denshi, this has been the history of Bitcoin, goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.